Hi, I'm Barry Mitchell. Welcome to Simply Science. I'm just hanging out here on my terrace working on my quarantine. How about you slap on some SPF 50 and join me as we take a look back at some of our best stories of the past year. Like this one from our Earth Day special, Global Warming. I know, like we don't have enough to worry about right now. But forest fires, rising sea levels, climate change, are all things our children are going to have to deal with. Will they be up to the challenge? Here's Carol Ann Riddell. These seventh graders are very aware of their ecological footprint. In fact, that's exactly the project they're working on today. The environment is front and center here at Growing Up Green Middle School in Long Island City, with recycling reminders at every turn, a composting tumbler, a rooftop garden, and children who take climate change seriously. I think for my generation, I think it's a, like a very big like problem that like we have to act now. We're going to be the most uh, dealing with it. Also, like my children, they won't have the things that we have now or had before. Research indicates more and more people are concerned about the planet. According to a survey released last year, 69% of Americans are worried about global warming, including 29% who are very worried, an eight-point increase since March of 2018. And studies show extreme weather takes more than a physical toll. 25 to 50 percent of people exposed to an extreme weather disaster are at risk of adverse mental health effects. Up to 54 percent of adults and 45 percent of children suffer depression after a natural disaster. Is it your sense as a teacher that kids are concerned about this, are worried about climate change? Definitely, and that is one of the biggest challenges is just having them not feel so overwhelmed um, with this subject. Teacher Sarah Jennings tries to keep the topic manageable for kids. There's a lot of environmental storytelling that I um, try to use as a tool in my classroom instead of just the scary data points. One of the suggestions we heard, help your kids feel empowered when it comes to our environment. It could be as simple as reusing a bag or unplugging a device. The point is, show them they can make a difference. It does need to be age appropriate. It is a big, it is um, a large scale problem mm -hmm. and it can be really scary. So I think it does need to be tailored, but I wouldn't hide the facts from the kids. I think they can handle it um, as long as you provide actionable steps. Whenever we talk to kids, we introduce the issue, we show them the full scale of it, but we always try to include what steps can they take as individuals, what steps can they take with their family, what steps can they take with their community, right? Because there is something you can do. When it comes to talking to kids about any tough topics, the American Psychological Association has some tips. Think about what you want to say. Find a quiet moment. Find out what they know share your feelings, tell the truth, but lay out facts at a level they can understand, and reassure children, let them know you're available to talk again. Another important point, even adults don't have all the answers. It's okay to not know all the answers and like let's look up that together and kind of doing it together so you're looking up information together. Kids, like grown-ups, want to be part of the solution. I compost, I recycle, I donate my clothing. It feels really good and feels like I'm doing something to help, but then it's also like thinking of the big picture. A big picture with a role for all of us to play. I'm Carol Ann Riddell for Simply Science. The fashion industry throws away tons of textiles every year. Where do you think I get my clothes? Our Mike Gilliam met with a nonprofit that's keeping those fabric scraps out of landfills. One man's trash can certainly end up being another's treasure. And that is absolutely true when it comes to something called Fab Scrap. Fab Scrap is a New York City based nonprofit. We work with the fashion industry to redistribute and recycle their excess fabric. Jessica Schreiber is the founder of Fab Scrap. She says she got the idea when she was working in the offices of the New York City Department of Sanitation. Brands were reaching out asking what they could do with all of their 
fabric waste from the product development process that wasn't a garment. So not the shoes and handbags and accessories or apparel, but all of the waste material in creating those items. There really wasn't a place for them to get rid of their waste. So she came up with the idea for Fab Scrap and went and got funding in a truly millennial way. I was on season one of Project Runway Fashion Startup. Really? Um, it was sort of like Project Runway's Shark Tank. Uh -huh. um, so I pitched to a panel of four investors in the fashion industry my new fashion recycling idea, and we came away with $60,000 to get started. That's great. <laughs> one of the main ideas is to save all of this fabric that would clog landfills and wreak havoc on the environment. And we're talking a lot of fabric. So, I've been looking at this big pile that you have here, okay? <laughs> how much textile is this, first of all, and, and how would this affect the environment if we went to the landfill? Um, this is our big to-do pile. We still need to sort all of this. It's about 60,000 pounds of fabric, and keeping this amount of fabric from landfill has the CO2 reducing benefit of planting 6,000 trees. 6,000 trees? 6,000 trees, if we're able to keep all of this from landfill. Here's how it works. When a company signs up, they get two types of bags to put their scraps in. Black bags for scraps that have identifying patterns or logos that can't be recycled and must be shredded. And brown bags for fabric that can be recycled. When the bags are full, the company calls for a pickup. And all of that stuff is brought to a warehouse at the Brooklyn Army Terminal to be sorted. So the small pieces of fabric that aren't big enough to reuse um, get shredded and this raw shredded material is called shoddy and then shoddy gets used to create insulation for new buildings, carpet padding, mattress stuffing, it's used a lot in the automotive industry. The larger pieces end up either going to volunteers who get free fabric for working at Fab Scrap or are sold at thrift store rates. They also have leather, lace, trim, buttons and other items used by fashion designers. Because Fab Scrap is a nonprofit, all of the money raised through sales and donations is funneled back into the organization to be used in their effort. Since Fab Scrap opened in 2016, they say they've saved 458,000 pounds of materials from landfills. Both customers and brands have embraced the idea. We're working now with Marc Jacobs, Oscar de la Renta, J. Crew, Express, Theory. Lafayette 148, Eileen Fisher, a lot of New York-based companies. In June, Fab Scrap opened the Fab Scrap Shop on the edge of the Garment District in Manhattan. The idea was to get closer to the people working in the fashion industry. The shop looks like an upscale fabric shop in the city, but it's a thrift shop and the prices are right. Camille Tegel is director of reuse for Fab Scrap and a former designer. The crazy thing is that we receive yardage of fabric that is completely reusable, um, that was originally headed towards landfill. So even all of these rolls of fabric, um, these are all yardage, they just don't have the cardboard in them, but they're all available for people to shop and we just organize them in a way that is easy to, it's easily approachable and not as intimidating as a pile of fabric. <laughs> Standing in the shop amidst all the beautiful colors and textures almost makes you forget about the gritty work that's going on back at the Brooklyn Warehouse and the mission, which is to reuse and save the environment. For me, if people can understand that things that were originally destined towards landfill can be reused and upcycled and kept into circulation and have an extended life, to me that's really important. The Fab Scrap Shop is located on West 26th Street between 6th and 7th. In years to come, they hope to expand to L.A. and other cities in the U.S. and around the globe. I'm Mike Gilliam for Simply Science. There are almost one million asteroids zipping around space, and they don't observe social distancing. In recent months, some of them have come uncomfortably close to Earth. Here's Susan Jun. The Washington Post reports NASA has confirmed a so-called city killer asteroid narrowly missed hitting Earth. What's more alarming, scientists say they had no idea it was coming. 
It was a news story that nearly rocked the world. A close encounter that startled scientists who say the football field-sized asteroid could have destroyed a city, with an impact similar to that of a large nuclear weapon. The enormous space rock named 2019 OK whizzed by Earth in late July. According to data from NASA, it was estimated to be 187 to 427 feet wide, coming within 45,000 miles of Earth, the largest asteroid to come that close in a century. No, it's not science fiction like in the movie Armageddon. Instead, a real reminder that asteroids can kill. People don't take us seriously because they think this is something out of Hollywood. But remember, Hollywood got its inspiration from a real rock that actually hit Mexico that actually did wipe out the dinosaurs. So this is not science fiction anymore. This is deadly serious. Famed physicist Dr. Michio Kaku is a professor of theoretical physics at the City College of New York and author of the bestseller, Future of Humanity. Once every hundred years or so, we have a city buster, an object about the size of an apartment building that comes burning up into the atmosphere, striking the earth, mainly in the ocean, so we're not even aware of it. Russia got hit twice, 1908, the Tunguska impact, and also 2013, right outside Chelyabinsk, right on schedule. Once every few thousand years, we have a nation buster, like Apophis. Apophis is an asteroid bigger than the Rose Bowl, and it'll skim by the Earth in 2029. It'll probably miss, but then it'll come back for a second try and in 2036, it might actually hit the Earth. Then we have the planet killer. That is the planet buster, like the object that hit Mexico, uh, the Yucatan of Mexico, about 65 million years ago. It was about six miles across. And the impact was so great that it probably wiped out the dinosaurs. But the recent failure to detect the 2019 OK asteroid has many wondering what can be done and what isn't being done. According to internal NASA emails disclosed to the public, the asteroid managed to slip past all detection methods and was spotted only 24 hours before flyby because initially it was moving too slow to be identified as an NEO or near Earth object. The failure to spot the NEO brings up long-standing concerns about the lack of government funding for asteroid detection. The first thing to do is to get more telescopes out there specifically designed for looking for near-Earth objects. Second, we have to look at the space program, not just going back to the moon, but perhaps having a spare rocket, an insurance policy, Plan B, capable of reaching deep space so once we have the tools to spot a destructive asteroid headed straight to Earth, then what? The leading theory about how to get rid of a killer asteroid is to deflect it. That is, let's say you were to generate a nuclear explosion a fair distance away from an asteroid, the shock wave. The shock wave from that detonation would be enough to nudge, nudge the asteroid out of the way without necessarily blowing it apart. Currently, NASA believes it has identified more than 90% of planet killer asteroids. There are scientists who are organizing groups in order to lobby Congress so they can allocate money to NASA. We have to reach the people to tell them that it's not an immediate threat. We're not talking about bankrupting the country to arm ourselves against rocks from space. No, but it's an insurance policy because it will happen. It's the law of physics, the laws of probability. It will happen again. For Simply Science, I'm Susan Jun. Since Superstorm Sandy, try saying that three times fast, scientists and citizens have teamed up to do research on how rising sea levels and weather will affect our area in the future. Like seeing guppies swimming up your street? Here's Andrew Falzone. It was a sunny late afternoon when we visited Old Howard Beach. You wouldn't expect the streets to flood, but the restless water of Jamaica Bay found its way through storm drains and onto the blacktop. 
The high tide brought with it some unexpected visitors, small bait fish going for a swim on city streets. We stuck around to watch the water as twilight turned to nightlight. I've heard a lot of stories from residents. It's either due to old infrastructure or storm drains just getting really clogged up. Helen Cheng has heard many accounts from locals as to exactly why flooding happens in the city's waterfront communities. Her job now is to collect flood data that will help the government figure out what's causing it and how to fix it. The Jamaica Bay Community Flood Watch Program is a program that uses community citizen science to document uh, flooding um, due to high tides or coastal flooding or from st uh, storms. The Jamaica Bay Community Flood Watch Program is run by the Science and Resilience Institute, a consortium of institutions, including CUNY, that was formed in response to Superstorm Sandy. Hurricane Sandy was the big story and is the story for many residents. And so the more we can understand about the frequency, the better we can be prepared of what flooding would look like in the future. At the end of Old Howard Beach is Hamilton Beach, a tiny outlying peninsula community with only one road in and one road out. Roger Gendron leads the local civic group. He tried using Facebook before Sandy to keep neighbors up to date on flood info, but it took a superstorm to send the community a wake up call. When Sandy hit in October of 2012, I had 22 members on my civic page. I currently have almost 900 on the civic page. Nearly the entire community had to be rebuilt after Superstorm Sandy, so it wasn't hard to get folks like Roger to participate. In fact, it's as easy as taking a picture on your cell phone. Well, if you have an immovable object in front of your house, telephone pole, a fire hydrant, anything, go out there and put a mark on it with tape or paint, six inches, 12 inches, two feet, three feet. Because then when you take a picture, if that is in that picture, then you have a good reference. Then you know oh, there's a six inch mark, the water's six inches in the street. But in a community that has complained to City Hall about flooding issues since long before the superstorm, there can be some cynicism about participating in the program. It's that old, my vote doesn't count, my voice is never heard. Well, it's wrong in this case because the photos that, that I've sent in and the residents have sent in, what they've done is they've actually enabled NOAA to kind of hone their numbers when it comes to minor to moderate to major coastal flooding. The goals would be to, to really share those stories and those narratives about impacts of flooding as well as improve our flood forecasts or flood models um, so that way we can be better prepared and aware of when flooding would happen and be prepared to handle it. I'm Andrew Falzone for Simply Science on CUNY TV. A decade ago, I introduced you to Dr. Martin Schreibman, a Brooklyn College biologist who is experimenting with recirculating aquaculture, raising locally sourced seafood indoors. Well, now one of his protégés has taken those ideas and turned them into a commercial reality in a big way. A lot of the recirculating systems in this country raise freshwater fish. There are no other facilities in this country that raise uh, saltwater fish on a commercial scale, and there are no other facilities in the world like this that raise Bronzino. Eric Pedersen was a Wall Street investment banker who chucked it all to go fishing. I began my career on Wall Street. It really didn't resonate with me after the long haul, and I began thinking about what would combine my interest in fish and in water chemistry and, and in food. And uh, it didn't take long to happen upon recirculating aquaculture, which is what we, we do here in Waterbury. Where Ideal Fish opened for business in 2018. The goal? Raise 350,000 pounds a year of European sea bass, also called Bronzino. It's a delicious fish, Barry. It is really one of the most flavorful, uh, popular fish you know, in the Mediterranean. Uh, but as a result, these stocks in the Mediterranean are depleted. And so all the fish that's coming into this country from the Med are farmed. And by the time they hit your plate in this country, they're almost a week old. And some farm fish in ocean cages is exposed to pollution and disease. This type of facility can produce local, sustainable, traceable, antibiotic-free seafood to consumer that's ravenous for that product. Our biggest customers are obviously in New York and in Boston. We're in all of the boutique food markets. Even if you're a small restaurant just north of Boston, you can order our fish 
and it will be there within 24 hours of your order. So Barry, the reason you're putting on these booties is that we are a biosecure facility. We don't want to have pathogens brought into the facility that could potentially you know, make the fish sick. Eric, did I mention I'm on a salt-free diet? Well, then you should stay out of this room, Barry, because this is where we make our own seawater that we grow the fish in. We're in Waterbury, Connecticut, nowhere near natural seawater, and yet we're growing an ocean-going fish here. So each one of these bags will make up somewhere around 8,000 gallons of water. Eric sought the advice of experts in starting this unusual venture. One of which was Dr. Martin Schreibman. Macho fish, here guys. Who uh, ran the aquaculture research lab at Brooklyn College for many, many years. Huge pioneer in the industry and a huge influence and, and mentor to me. You want me to put my Speedo on? Well, what we have now is the fruition, Martin, of all of your hard work. I am so years. happy to see you. You're a lot grayer than when I first saw you. <laughs> You and I first met exactly 10 years ago at Brooklyn College when you had a prototype, but that was freshwater fish. Those were freshwater fish, it was tilapia, but the idea of growing a sustainable fish product in an area, in an urban area, where people demand this fresh quality food, food is, is essential. Throughout their 12 to 14 month life, the pampered Bronzinos graduate through a series of carefully monitored tanks. We actually liken it to a spa. They've got a great life. They do have a great life, except for one very bad day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd like to see how we actually recover the fish poo, which is then used to uh, create composted organic fertilizer. So farmers in Connecticut and the New York area can use this product to create a non-petrochemical based source of nutrients for their plants. And the cycle continues. One after the next. Eric, thanks so much for the tour. I have for you this official <laughs> proclamation, renaming Waterbury, Connecticut, Saltwaterbury. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much, Barry. Could you please repeat that? I'm sort of hard of hearing. God help us. Dogs are man's best friend, and the secret to that relationship may lie in the eyebrows of the beholder. Here's Donna Hanover. New research explains in part how the dogs we love are able to win our hearts. Most of them have a muscle called the levator above their eyes that allows them to lift their inner eyebrows. Animal behavior expert Julie Hecht met us at the Hunter College Thinking Dog Center to tell us why that eyebrow movement matters. So when dogs make this expression, it really does essentially melt our hearts. Like it's a very endearing um, expression that we might associate with sad or cute because when they raise that muscle up and give that expression, um, we're seeing a bigger eye potentially, which we find cute and attractive. More so, infant-like. And, and more infant-like, 100%. So all of these things are eliciting our caretaking response. The new research was led by Dr. Julianne Kaminsky of the United Kingdom with help from several U.S. scientists. The main finding was that dogs and their closest relatives, wolves, have similar facial muscles, except most dogs have the LAOM, the levator muscle. That allows dogs to make what is coded as the AU101 movement, raising the inner eyebrows with much greater intensity than wolves can. The researchers called it a striking difference for species separated only about 33,000 years ago. Is evolution at play? Did the levator muscle actually develop because it made people want to provide dogs food and shelter? The scientists said, we show that these remarkably fast muscular changes can be linked directly to enhanced social interaction with humans. Julie Hecht says the eyebrow movement does seem directed mostly at people. Dogs aren't, to, to the best of our knowledge today, aren't using these movements with other dogs. They're really using these movements in the presence of humans. The scientists studied nine wolves in two different animal parks and 27 dogs from different shelters. What's really interesting is they found that in um, a set of shelter dogs, dogs who performed this behavior of inner brow raise were adopted quicker than dogs that performed this behavior less frequently. Especially in this context of a shelter, we might see that, um, that inner brow raise is sad 
or, you know, please take me home. Now, what that behavior actually means for the dog might not necessarily mean that, but we are projecting onto them, and therefore those dogs that put on the inner brow raise more often were scooped up and taken home. Julie, who is a PhD candidate at the City University of New York Graduate Center, cautions that more research is needed about why dogs are raising their inner eyebrows. It also might just be something that they naturally do when their head is down and they're looking up. They just naturally make that expression. So we really need to test what those behavioral expressions mean for dogs and not just put our human um, human like assessment onto it. In any case, eye contact with your pup does have important results. Julie has written about research that oxytocin, the cuddle hormone famous for helping mothers bond with their babies, also comes into play when people and their dogs gaze at each other. What's pretty exciting is that when, when you take a dog and a person who know each other and have a relationship, when they look at each other, the levels of oxytocin, kind of the feel good, the bonding hormone, increases in both the human and the dog, which gives us a sense that when you have this known pair um, and they know each other, looking at each other feels good and it reinforces their relationship. So if you're spending time with your dog or thinking of adopting one, make sure you have a bit of eye-to-eye -eye gazing time. Watch if your pup keeps your attention by lifting the inner eyebrows. It'll bond you, as science says it was meant to do. I'm Donna Hanover for Simply Science. And that's our show. Remember, you can always reach us at tv.cuny.edu and find us on Facebook and YouTube. I'm Barry Mitchell. Hope to see you next time on Simply Science.